Early in the morning of Sunday, the 29th of October, 1648, a group of heavily armed men quietly slipped into the Yorkshire town of Doncaster. Although this town was in the hands of the parliamentary army, they gained access quite easily by showing the guard uh, some false documents that bore the signature of Oliver Cromwell. This was a royalist hit squad. They then proceeded along the silent streets of a sleeping town until they reached the door of the house where their unsuspected victim was sleeping soundly in his bed. The name of this man was Colonel Thomas Rainsborough, a man who I personally consider to be the greatest of all the level of leaders. You may remember, we discussed it earlier, that he was one of the most outspoken, probably the most outspoken defender of the Levellers' course of the Putney debates. And because of his radical views, and also because he was an officer, he wasn't from a poor family, therefore he was regarded as a class traitor by the Royalists. And his fierce opposition, above all, his fierce opposition to any deal with the King Charles, made him a hated figure in the eyes of the Royalists and therefore a prime target for assassination. Yes, but you know, there are many aspects of this murder that, uh, that aroused suspicion of foul play uh, at the time, particularly in the ranks of, of the Levellers, who actually suspected Oliver Cromwell of being involved in the murder. I'm not sure that that's correct, but to this very day, it is a matter of uh, fierce debate. The killers, and this is the suspicious, one of the suspicious, suspicious aspects, the killers then gained access to Rainsborough's quarters, which were left entirely unguarded. He was an important man, a colonel of the army and a prominent level. His house was completely unguarded. According to reports at the time, the, 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 the officer in charge of his protection was nowhere to be seen. In fact, he was supposed to have spent the night in a brothel. We don't know if that's true, but certainly the circumstances are suspicious. And the effects of this poor man, of course, was butchered. Uh, defenseless, aroused from his sleep and just murdered, slaughtered like a, like a lamb to the slaughterhouse. Yes, but the effects of this murder were immediate and they were dramatic. The royalists, of course, naturally uh, rejoiced in his death, uh, the death of a hated enemy, but there was an equal and opposite reaction in the ranks of the army in particular, where they, they were swept by a wave of cold fury at this uh, murderous uh, act of the counter-revolution. Now, Karl Marx pointed out that uh, in order to advance, sometimes the revolution needs the whip of the counter-revolution, and that was certainly the case here. Rainsborough, I should say, he was probably not well known these days. His name has been more or less blotted out by history, uh, overshadowed by other figures such as John Milburn and so on. But at the time, uh, Thomas uh, Rainsborough was loved and revered by the masses, as I think there was a striking parallel here with Marat in the French Revolution. He was really uh, adored as a, as a leader of the mass, spokesman of the masses. And this was shown by his funeral, which turned into a mass demonstration of popular angry anger, attended by many thousands of ordinary people. I think one royalist uh, will observe that actually calculated but there were 30,000 men just on horses. And of course, there were many, many more would be on foot. The streets of London were full of uh, angry people, actually, demanding uh, vengeance. And the desire for vengeance, for revenge, for the murder of uh, Rainsborough was uh, an important uh, element in the situation, where already after the Second Civil War, there, were, there was a growing call for the trial and execution of the king and every, every one of the royalist leaders who were responsible for bloody acts such as the murder of uh, Thomas Rainsborough. Rainsborough's own regiment uh, issued a, a statement demanding the, I quote, impartial justice be done upon the eminent undertakers of this second war in order that, quote, cruel mercies showed to, 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 to our implacable enemies might not endanger the lives of our dearest friends. Dearest friends, of course, would include, above all, Thomas Rainsborough. 
But even as the army was still fighting, there was still fighting going on, even at this distance, although the, in effect the, the Second Civil War had been won, but there were pockets of life of resistance, for example, in Yorkshire. Even as the army was still fighting for their lives on the battlefield, the parliament was continuing its underhand dealings for negotiations with the king, attempting to reach a settlement that would restore, restore him to his throne. Although for a second time had only been defeated by the, by the masses, by the army, by armed force, you know, these gangsters were going to hand him back his throne on a plate that was really too much for anybody to suffer. And on the, on the 15th of November, the day after Rainsborough's mass funeral, the worst fears of the army were, were, were confirmed. When Parliament, Parliament voted that the King should be brought back to London, and I, and I quote, I quote, with freedom, safety and honour, so soon as the concessions of the treaty are con concluded and agreed. And therefore, once again, the army and the parliament found themselves on opposite sides of the barricades. You know, here you have dual power again expressed in the sharp point, which must be resolved. This contradiction has to be resolved, which is basically a class, a class question, of course, between rich and poor, between revolution and counter-revolution. And uh, to the extent, uh, even to the extent that the obstinacy of the king, he was digging his heels and making new demands, as, as he always would, the mood of the army in particular was hardening all, all the time. And from all sides, there was a storm, a, a, a wave of petitions which poured from the regiments, and the message was loud and clear. Justice on the king. Now, the sight of this radicalization, increased right? radicalization of the, of the army, filled the moderates in parliament with, with terror. Uh, I quote the words of, of, of quite a good, I think it's quite a good historian, Richard Green, a Victorian historian, who tried to describe the mood of the, of the parliamentary moderates. And uh, I quote, I think they're quite, uh, quite an accurate description. They shrank with horror from the sight of the king at the bar of a court of justice, or yet more on the scaffold. And then it goes on. The demand for a new parliament, and that was the main demand of the argument, apart from the execution of the king, we want these parliament, this parliament to be dismissed at new elections on a wider uh, suffrage. That was the main de democratic demand. And, and Green, Green says, the demand for a new parliament was hardly less horrible. A new parliament meant the rule of the sectaries. That's, that's the left wing, that's the army. The rule of the sectaries. A revolution in the whole political and religious system of the realm. Get a rule of that. That puts it in a nutshell, I think. And he sums up, to give way to Charles altogether, to surrender all that the war had, had, had gained, seemed better than this. And that, I think, puts it in a nutshell very well. Now, at this point, the, 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 the balance of forces shifts, and also there's, a, there's a, a, change, a change, an important change, also in, 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 in particular in the attitude of Cromwell. The influence among the level, levels and among the soldiers now would increase rapidly, especially after the murder of, the, of Rainsborough. And their, their, their power had been demonstrated clearly by the funeral. Uh, in fact, uh, all these events, in reality, were pushing Cromwell into a, 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 more and more into an, ally, an alliance with the revolutionary left. He moved sharply to the left at this time. You see, there's a kind of Bonapartist element to use. It's a little bit... Uh, wrong to use a, a word but before Napoleon, born Napoleon had been born, but it's the same phenomenon of an army leader, a revolution who balances between the classes. Yes, but sooner or later he's got to come down on the side of one class or the other, which of course eventually he did. But at this stage, Cromwell was forced to, to, to conclude that uh, the only way to strike blows against the enemy in Parliament and against Charles indeed, was to base himself on the, on, the, on the radical left, on the revolutionaries, on the army, of course. Cromwell needed allies in this battle. And where else was, was he to look other than the levelers, the most militant and determined section of the army? Yes, but this was no, no easy task, you understand. Just think about it. After the, after the sharp clashes and the putty debates, and especially after the, after the violent suppression of the army mutiny, in, 40, in 1647, the levelers, uh, the levelers and the radical independence, that's to say Cromwell, uh, had become bitterly divided. 
But nevertheless, Cromwell was prepared. That's the point. He was prepared to lean on the army to strike blows against the parliament, which was striking to, to compromise with the king. And therefore, believe it or not, he invited the levelers to meet the grandees, meet the officers, to discuss uh, a, a constitutional settlement. They met, actually, the two sides met in a pub in London called the, the Nags Head. There are a few Nags Heads on. I don't know which one this refers to, whether it still stands, probably not. But this this was a typical level of meeting place, by the way. The fact that they met in such a place is an indication of an important shift that was taking place. Yeah, but the deal was by no means easy. It wasn't easy at all. They still couldn't get an agreement on the fundamental questions of what to do, whether to cut the king's head off or not. And of course, the question of whether to, to dissolve or to purge the parliament. The army wanted both. They wanted to be both purged and then dissolved quickly. But the mood of discontent in the army was growing all the time. This was shown in, in a remonstrance brought up, which was drawn up in, in St. Albans in, in November, which demanded that, king, that the king and all the royalists, quote, guilty of all the bloodshed in these, in these intestine wars, be put on trial together with, this is interesting, together with, I quote, contrivers and abettors. That's to say together with the moderates in parliament. They were there. They were their heads as well. So this is quite radical, revolutionary stuff. A series of hasty meetings were, were, were arranged in which the levelers and the left independents, you know, the kind of left, uh, left Mensheviks, you could say, could uh, hammer out their differences. Finally, they reached some kind of an agreement. It was known as the uh, a remonstra remonstrance or declaration of the army. It was put before Parliament on the 20th of November. Yes, but all of this, these discussions were taking place at a time when the moderates were already well on the way to establishing their betrayal, as they hoped, mistakenly as it happened. And after three days of violent debates in Parliament, the debates now were very violent. On the 5th of December, the majority of both houses voted for the acceptance of the terms which Charles had offered. Complete and absolute betrayal, complete and absolute surrender. And if this, if this would have been uh, agreed to, it would, have meant, it would have meant that Charles would have won, although he'd been defeated on the battlefield twice. So, at this, this obviously was a red rag. So this was the, the last straw. This was positively the last straw as far as the army were concerned. Not just the rank and file, but the more militant leaders, including Cromwell. Uh, were opposed, radically opposed, of any conciliation with the king whatsoever. The agitators were still these, these commissars, these, these uh, revolutionaries, were, of course, were played an active role, above all, in these days. The cry went up on all sides, you know. Enough of this, let us march on London. We've had enough of this. The cavalry regiments, here you are, the right of recall was, was, uh, was used. The cavalry regiments recalled their representatives and sent more, more determined and more radical elements to replace them. This was how things were going. And finally, of course, the army began to, move, to march on London itself. The stage was set now for a new and dramatic turn in events. And on the 6th of December, one day after the parliament had taken this, uh, this step, on the 6th of, this hour, of, the, of December, an extraordinary scene could be observed in the, in the doors of the House of Commons. A man called Colonel Thomas Pride, who was said to have been formerly a dray man, some kind of a street trader or something, led a group of soldiers, armed soldiers, to the Parliament. He surrounded the House of Commons with two regiments and then took up his position quietly in front of the front door, the door of the House. And holding in his hands, he had a list of 40 members, all supporters of the moderate majority, with orders from the Council of Officers to exclude them from the House. And he had every intention, believe me, of carrying out that instruction to the letter. And as each man, just imagine this, you know, I sometimes wish I'd that been, I could be in that position today with the present Houses of Parliament. Wouldn't it be wonderful? As each one of these members of Parliament uh, uh, stepped to the door, stepped through the door, he found himself arrested and put into confinement. One of them asked, one of the members asked him, astonished, he said, well, what right do you ask? 
by the right of the sword. Hugh Peters, this Puritan, snapped back at him. And that was an argument that admitted no reply. So in this way, 49, I think, 49 members of the Presbyterian party were seized and sent into uh, an adjacent room from where they were taken to different inns, not to, not to have a drinking party, but in preparation to go to prison and trial. More than, in the end, more than 160 members were, were excluded. But the House still remained stubborn in spite of all this. They still remained that they, that they wanted to continue with their, with their betrayal. However, the following morning, many more members were also sent on their way. And finally, the, the nerves of, of, of the rest, they, they finally gave way. The next day, the 7th of, 7th of December, Cromwell off offered his support to the purge, which is a bit amusing because probably he'd organized the whole affair anyway. And the rump, as it be then became, it was a rump because most of the members were excluded. But what was left, a few members that were left, known as the rump parliament, immediately reversed the former vote, declaring the king's concessions unsatisfactory. That's the, and that was the end of it. This is a decisive per turning point in the revolution. The Presbyterian counter-revolution was defeated and the way was now open to the next step. Now here's the question, here's the question. The army was now in control of the nation and Cromwell is in control of the army. Question, what would it do with this power? That's the issue, what would it do with this new power? Well, we'll see. First of all, on the 1st of January, New Year's Day, 1649, the Rump Parliament set up a High Court of Justice for the sole purpose of putting King Charles I on trial for treason. Now, this is an extraordinary event, you know. I mean, you might say, well, look, uh, many kings have been executed in, the, in the England before, even without a trial, in the most barbarous manner. Yes, indeed, that's true. But all of these cases, they were kings that were killed by other kings and by members of the aristocracy, right? fighting, fighting like dogs for the possession of the throne. And that's true. Yes, but this is different, isn't it? This was entirely a different case. It wasn't a case of one aristocrat murdering another in order to get possession of the throne. This was a revolutionary act, something without any precedent in any country. It was uh, the, the nation, the people, putting Charles on trial for treason against the people, against the people itself. Now, for many people, we have to say that the trial and the execution of the king was a step too far. They were terrified. They were horrified. How could you execute the king? The, the, the uh, elected by God, you know, this kind of stuff. And even in, in order to hold a trial, it was necessary to have men that were prepared to be act as judges, and that wasn't that easy thing. I quote one, this is really a, an interesting case. When a man called Alg Algin and Sidney refused to be one of the king's judges, Cromwell furiously declared, answered to him, spat in his face, not, not literally, we will cut off his head with the crown on, with the crown upon it. He said, that's a, that's a, "And this is precisely more or less what was done." Although the crown wasn't present on his head, but he certainly was tried and executed. Now I won't deal much time with, with the trial and execution of Charles. Enough has been said and written about this. Enough sentimental bills and nonsense has been said. A whole mythology has been created around this. And through the mists of time. People forget uh, what, it, what, it was, what it was like. Charles is, is presented more or less as a saintly figure, an innocent chap that has been dragged before the courts uh, unjustly and tried uh, in a kangaroo trial and murdered by, by all this stuff. You see, people forget Charles was not a saint. He was, to quote Oliver Cromwell, a man of blood, a man steeped with blood from head to toes, guilty of the... Of the of the killings of, of countless numbers of men, women, and children in the most barbarous, uh, barbarous manner. And to the, to, to the contemporaries, and now, now people adopt the sentimental attitude, they snivel and they write all kinds of groveling. Of course, nowadays, we've all, we've all got to be monarchists, haven't we? So you can't write bad words about King Charles. The man was a monster. Yes, a man of blood. And to his contemporaries, they didn't see it like this at all. The main demand was precisely that his head should be cut off his shoulders, because in, and him and the others, and all the rest of them, not enough of them were executed. That's the, 
attitude that most people would say. It's a bit like, if you like, uh, by the way, the end, I, I remember the end, well, I wasn't around at the time, but at the end of the First World War, there was a big demand in nice, democratic, civilized England. There was a demand, hang the Kaiser. Oh, yes, he wasn't hanged. I mean, you think what you like about that, but there you are. But just imagine if they'd have caught Adolf Hitler at the end of the Second World War. He was certainly steeped in blood. How many people would have objected to his execution? Come on, come off it. Charles was executed. He deserved to be executed a thousand times over. Yes, but his execution wasn't the end of the matter. You see, here now another struggle opens up, if you like, another dual power, if you want, begins to open up. After the execution of the king, the split between Cromwell and the left emerges once more with an even sharper, in an even sharper form. On the 70th of March, by the way, this is an historic date, the House of Commons voted to abolish the monarchy and the House of Lords. Bravo, I say, bravo. And why do they exist today? It means the English Revolution has not yet been completed, my friends. And that's something that should be duly noted. And that's what we should criticize, not the ex execution of Charles Stuart. They voted for the abolition of the monarchy and the House of Lords and appointed the Council of State as an executive authority. Now, for, the, for Cromwell, let's analyze a bit more closely the, the, the motivations here. For Cromwell and the army grandees, who were men of property, by the way, this marked the end of the revolution. So far, there was the end of the road. They decided so far and no further. Yes, but for the, revel, for the, the levelers and the ordinary people, this was not satisfactory. The execution of the king could not be the end of the story. Not even the, 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 the announcement of a, a, a republic de facto. That's not the end of the state. And therefore they pressed that the revolution should be carried out to the end. You see, what, they are, what this ordinary soldiers, which represented, as I've said earlier, they've represented, the, they the organized representatives of, of the oppressed people of this land. They didn't just want a purge of the parliament, they wanted this complete dissolution and elections to be held on a far wider suffrage. Not quite the universal suffrage, but I've explained that in the previous uh, episode. And their main demands, and certainly not the social demands and political demands, had not been addressed. Now they demanded action. What we see, what, what Pride's purge has and achieved was not to hand power to the people, but to the army. That is to say, let's be clear about it, not the rank and file soldiers, but the army grandees and Cromwell in particular. And this fact brought to uh, raise now this is a severe confrontation between Cromwell, for whom the, the, the democratic rule of the people was never on the agenda. He never stood for this, never ever. He opposed it in the, in the Putney debates, as you will recall. And he was quite alarmed at these this pressure from the left. He, he was alarmed by it. He, by the way, was still sitting in parliament. He intervened to control the movement and prevent the army from going any further. That was his main obsession at this stage. And the levelers in the army rapidly were coming to the conclusion, they had come to the conclusion, that Cromwell and the army grandees had betrayed the revolution. The same as Napoleon betrayed the French Revolution or Stalin betrayed the Russian Revolution. The same, same scenario. They would completed this. And this, this discontent of the leveler was expressed by a, a stream of pamphlets, quite offensive pamphlets, but they, they didn't mince their words in those days. And they published one particular, I think it was by Lilburn, I'm not quite sure. A pamphlet called England's New Chains Discovered. Title, I think, speaks for itself, doesn't it? And in another pamphlet, there were many of them. One of them made a, a really stinging attack, a personal attack against Cromwell, who they accused of hypocrisy, describing him as the new king. And here's a quote from it. He will lay, slamming him for hypocrisy, he was a bit of a hypocrite in, in some respects, I must say. And here's the quote. He will lay his hand on his breast and elevate his eyes and call God to record and he will weep, uh, weep, weep how and, re and, and repent. And even while he doth smile, and even, 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 while he, even while he doth smite you under the first rib, he sticks a knife in you. Even while he's praying to God, he sticks a knife in you. That's what they say. And he goes on, Oh, Cromwell, the pamphlet asked the questions on many people's minds. Oh, Cromwell, whither art thou aspiring? Where are you going? 
Now, these attacks really stung Juan Bravo to the quick. It must have infuriated. He was a man with a, a quick temper. And here he'd, he'd given everything for the revolution. He'd done his bit. He'd led the first. And here they criticize me and so forth. How dare they, you know? At the meeting of army officers, it's recorded, he banged his fist on the table and shouted, I tell you, sir, you have no other way to deal with these men but to break them, or they will break you. That's what he said. And then further on in the speech, he finished up. I tell you again, you are necessitated to break them. And that's how he finished. And Cromwell now, of course, directs his fire against the left. You see, he bases himself on the army to smash the, the, the right, and now he bases himself on the right wing in order to smash the army. That's what it boils down to. The House of Commons passed a vote condemning English chains as a seditious and liable, and liable to, lead, to lead to a new civil war. Very soon afterwards, leading levelers such as Richard, Richard Overton, John Lyburn and others were called before the Council of State to answer for their actions in these pamphlets. Lilburn, Wal Walwyn, Overton and Thomas, uh, Thomas Prince, the leveler treasurer, were arrested for treason by order of the Council of State. They were imprisoned. And there were demonstrations, big demonstrations calling for their release. A lot of these demonstrations were organized or led by women. And let's remind ourselves of the fact, very important to, at this juncture to make this point, women played a crucial role in the English Revolution. It was, the, it was their emancipation. They, it, they felt empowered. I don't like that word, but it, was, it actually, actually describes. They, became, they were able to preach and do things that men had always done in the past. And, they really were in favor of women's, a genuine liber, women's liberation. Okay? They, were, they turned up to protest outside the houses of parliament where they were met with a hostile response. And one of the, one of the members of parliament came out to, was, was immediately approached by the uh, angry female uh, petitioners. And he uttered the following phrase. Now to me, this is a very significant phrase that this man says. I quote, that it is not for women to petition. They might stay home and wash the dishes. Now, here you have the authentic voice of the counter-revolution speaking. I might, I might add, by the way, that the heckler, the woman heckler did not, uh, was not cowed by this. She had the wit as well as courage on her side. And she answered smartly, sir, we have scarce any dishes left for us to wash, and those we are not sure to keep. They even set upon Cromwell subsequently, and he was so taken aback. He said, What do you want? What do you want? And they said, We want our rights that were promised to us, that you promised to us. This was uh, the, 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 the mood that was developing, and it, was, it came to a head. Things came to a head. They had to come to a head. In May, when a serious army mutiny bro broke out, which exposed the fault lines within the army itself. Now there was this, I can't deal with it in detail, there were a series of uncoordinated revolts and mutinies. The immediate subject of which was the order that the Cromwell was, was preparing an intervention in Ireland. It's a separate subject I hope we'll have time to deal with. I must make the point, I think I might have made it already, that the levelers opposed this, by the way. They said we cannot uh, intervene, must not intervene in Ireland, and we mustn't, because the Irish people are only fighting for their rights, and we shouldn't set a foot, foot in Ireland until we've achieved our own rights in this country, which, has not been, which have not yet been met. This began, the revolt began in the West Country, in uh, Salisbury, actually, on the 1st of, 1st of May, significant date, 1649. Soldiers issued a joint declaration opposing the uh, rejecting the forced disband, disbandment of those who refused to go to Ireland, and also raised other political questions, do, re recalling the Putney debates, stating that they objected, be, objected to being deprived of our native liberties, quote unquote, and uh, they demanded the recall of the General Council and a meeting in which there be, should be two soldiers chosen out of every regiment. Now, uh, it, it, this was not a small uprising. This was not a small mutiny at all. Was, a number of regiments responded to the call and they began to meet up. This was posing a serious danger to Cromwell and therefore there was an immediate uh, meeting. Cromwell called a review 
of the troops, of the, the loyal troops of his and Fairfax's regiments in Hyde Park, actually, before heading west to confront the mutineers. Even here, it's significant to note that many of the soldiers turned up with, with green colors in there, sea green colors. That's the color of the levelers and so on. And some of them are, are, are announced that they would not fight against their fellow soldiers. This was a, the mutiny had spread as far as the, the regiments of Cromwell and Fairfax themselves. And Cromwell had the, the, the only, his only way out was to appeal to the soldiers, remind them of his revolutionary credentials. He addressed them again, promising, I quote, to live and die with them, but also what he said, to fight against those revolters who are now called levelers. Some of the troops said they, they, they would not fight against their friends, but in the end, in the end, you see, Cromwell had such a, a reputation, such an authority, that most of them in the end discarded the sea green emblems and were reduced to obedience. You see, they could see no alternative. That's the point. They could see no alternative. Now, to cut a long story short, Cromwell proceeded to, to, and succeeded in subduing most of the rebels without a great deal of difficulty. But about 4,000 of the most intransigent ones gathered in the small village of Burford. It's a very nice little place. You can still visit it in Oxfordshire. Yes, but this attractive little pretty little village was the scene of a very tragic event. It was the, the, the scene of the la leveler's last stand. They were taken by surprise. They didn't expect Cromwell to act so quickly, but he did. And by a series of forced marches, Colonel Reynolds and afterwards Fairfax and Cromwell fell upon the unsuspecting mutinies. By the way, they'd been deceived by previous offers of, uh, of pardon and so on and so forth. And therefore, they were, this, this took place, he arrived at Burford during the night, about midnight, I think. Probably the more, most of them must have been asleep. They weren't expecting this attack. And they were, they were completely un unprepared for defense. And they were deceived, as I say, by, by the false offer of a, of a truce, which is a cynical device that was used. Just imagine it in the, in the darkness, shots were fired, arms were clashing. Men couldn't distinguish friend from foe. Fighting was confused. The rebels anyway were disoriented, completely disoriented, unexpected, didn't expect this. And probably, I, I think that many of them no longer had the will to fight. And therefore, the result was frankly not in doubt. Few, few men were killed in the, in the fighting. The rest, about, the rest were taken prisoner. About 300 of them, the main mutineers, 300, I think, were taken prisoner and held overnight in the local church which served as a prison. This church still exists. And I, 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 if you've got a chance, you should go there. Go to Burford Church. And if you look at the baptismal font, it's a stone thing, you can still see that one of these poor devils signed his name. He carved his name with a knife. It's still there. You can see it today. Anthony Sedley, 1649, prisoner, a mute and pathetic reminder of a great human tragedy. Because the following morning, Cromwell selected three of the uh, ringleaders. They were shot to death in the churchyard. The rest were pardoned, but this was the end. This was a sad end to the levelers' revolt. And that day, the English Revolution, as a popular revolution, died at Burford. Now, Cromwell was prepared to crush the left wing, the very force that he himself had used from the beginning to carry through the revolution. But in so doing, we're not clear about this. People say, well, what's the role of Cromwell? Was he a revolution? revolution he wasn't really a revolution he was a revolutionary a very courageous revolutionary but he was a bourgeois revolutionary in the sense that the only possible objectively speaking given the conditions that existed the only possible result of this would be a bourgeois revolution and it did clear the ground for the development of capitalism in england there's no question of that and there could be no other character at that time the conditions for socialism or communism didn't exist now, with the suppression of the levelers, as I said, the, the real revolution had come to an end. And in a social sense, the whole process begins to go into reverse. All the dreams, think about it. It's a tragic situation for, for millions of people 
who had their hopes set. They believed that the, the, the reign of God, the kingdom of God was about, about to dawn. They believed this fervently. That, that's what they were fighting for, fighting for justice. Not just for a change at the top, but for genuine social equality and justice and so on. These hopes were now cruelly dashed. The hopes of all these brave men and women were shattered. But the traditions of the English Revolution still lived on and still live on. That's my message. And there was a little incident which is not generally well, at the time. I don't think many people noticed it, but it's an important uh, episode. In the month of April, it was reported that a group called the True Levelers, now known as the Diggers, for reasons which will become clear, had set up a camp. In St. In, in St. George's Hill near Windsor, and were proceeding to dig up the common land and produce goods in common. And although they were small in numbers, and they were complete, and they were also completely peaceful in their conduct, they were nevertheless immediately seen as a mortal threat by the men of property. And immediately action, immediate action was taken to destroy them. This took place on the 19th of April, shortly before the level of revolt was put down. The 19th of April, when the diggers were dispersed by troops, arrested and taken before Fairfax, before a court of law, court martial in effect. The digger leaders refused to move their hats. The final courageous expression of defiance in the face of the triumphant counter revolution. Yes, but their camp was destroyed. They were arrested. Leaders were sent to prison. And the counter revolutions even destroyed the seedlings that they were put, the, the, they, they tore up all, all the, the goods, that they, the, 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 the products that, that they produced, the cabbages, the peas, the, whatever they were growing. Yes, the seedlings that they were planted were torn up and their communist experiment was destroyed. But you know, the fruit of these seedlings still continue to exist today. And of all the tendencies in the English Revolution, the diggers were probably the smallest. Yes, they were the smallest. Yet it is the diggers whose traditions still survived and which have developed into the socialist movement of future generations, which we still defend to this very day.